and I would like to uh, invite Dr. Kaushik, Dr. Saxena, Dr. Pamias, and Dr. Wolf to please come on stage. <laughs> the networking session. Today's network networking session is going to focus on applying for PhD in MPS areas, applying for internships, and post PhD career prospects. So today on our panel we have Dr. Kareshma Kaushik, Dr. Uday Saxena, Dr. David Pamias, and Dr. Armin Wolf. I'm just going to read out a short intro for all of them, and then we'll begin. Dr. Karishma Kaushik is a physician scientist who received her MBBS from the Maharashtra University of Health Sciences, MD in Clinical Microbiology from the Armed Forces Medical College, Pune. She then earned a PhD in Molecular Genetics and Microbiology at the University of Texas at Austin, where subsequently she served as an Assistant Professor of Instruction in Biology. She returned to India as a Ramaslingaswamy Fellow in 2018 and established her research group at the University of Pune. Her lab studies complex infection states with a focus on wound infections and biofilms under human relevant conditions. She uses, she uses a wound infection on a chip platform to get insights into complex microenvironments that influence wound healing and infection. Thanks for being on the panel today, Dr. Kaushik. Dr. Uday Saxena is the co-founder and chief ideator of Reagene Biosciences. He was mentor in residence and professor of translational research at Dr. Reddy's Institute of Life Sciences, as well as co-founder of startup biotech companies. He has held executive and leadership positions at Park Davis, Atherogenics, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, and Carriers Therapeutics. With more than 20 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry, he's been responsible for leading teams that brought several drug candidates from IDEA into the clinic. Thanks for being on the panel today, Dr. Saxena. Dr. David Pamias is currently a researcher in the Department of Physiology at Lausanne University. He received his PhD at the Universidad Miguel Hernandez in Spain. During his trainee period at the European Commission Joint Research Center, Dr. Pamias worked on new 3D models to assess new developmental neurotoxicity. Afterwards, he joined the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing. He's a recipient of the Colgate Palmolive Postdoctoral Fellowship Award and the 2017 Young Researcher America's Lush Award. He's working on the use of new in vitro technologies to quantify adverse outcome pathways to help regulatory decision making. Thanks for being on the panel today, Dr. Pamias. Finally, Dr. Armin Wolf is the Chief Scientific Officer at Inspiro. He's a biochemist by training and earned his PhD at the DKFZ German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg. He maintains a dual appointment as a professor of toxicology hello, hello. at the Technical University of, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this. What he said <laughs> in Germany. <laughs> An accomplished pharma R&D executive and board certified toxicologist with more than 30 years of cumulative experience at Novartis and Janssen, Dr. Wolf is a leading expert in mechanistic and investigative safety and discovery dedicated to the development of physiologically relevant models for industry applications. Thanks for being on the panel today, Dr. Wolf. So we're going to start off with some questions which have already been sent to us uh, by participants. So let me go ahead with the first question. And I would like uh, any one of the panelists can uh, begin and talk about your experiences. So the first question is, after doing a PhD, what is better for growth perspectives for the coming decade? Academia, post-doctorate, or industrial jobs? I think, I think they're asking, you know, the answers to the universe. Um, pretty much everybody sitting here has gone through uh, that question. So I'll tell you how I made those decisions. Um, so I made those decisions pretty early when I was doing a PhD. Um, I think Manny and I were talking about this, you know. Um, I tried to visualize myself as a faculty. And I mean, when you're doing a PhD, you know pretty much what a faculty does, right? You have your own domain, you have 10, 12 students, and you kind of publish and write grants. So that was one track ahead of me, and the other visualization I did was to join the industry and then kind of get into the industry, eventually be management, and eventually be CEO and all that. So. I could not never ever visualize myself as a faculty. I mean, that was very clear to me that I would struggle in that route simply because I didn't see myself. So uh, I think the key is to visualize uh, where you want to be in five years. Um, the other thing is um, you are either a 
graduate student or a postdoc, what you do between now and the next 10 years is pretty much going to decide the rest of your 40, 50 years of your life. Um, so don't take it lightly. These are decisions that have to be evaluated and made very carefully which way you want to go. So I would strongly suggest that all of you have a three-year vision for yourself. Right after this meeting, write down where you see yourself in three years. Then break it down into milestones. Okay, I want to be in industry. What's the first milestone? Let me get in contact with industry. What's the second milestone? Industry likes to work on disease area, like that. So a three-year vision for yourself in this day and age, it wasn't true for me or when Manny or when Suresh because it was different times those, but today it's very competitive and it's also global. Somebody sitting in the US can do your job, somebody sitting here can do a job in US, right? So, my, so visualize and then translate that into a three year plan. Without a three year plan, without a plan, you're planning for failure according to me. Thank you. Are not too many. Very, as you can see, the, uh, Europe and North America is working at the cutting edge. So to get a faculty position in one of those institutes is going to mean maybe two, three really good postdocs where you've actually published work that can get you that faculty position. Returning to India, if you do a postdoc out of India, returning to India means you are definitely going to face challenges with the kind of infrastructure and tools needed to succeed in that academic faculty position. We are also seeing that there is a gap between what we can do in India and what they are doing outside of India. Secondly, I also think money is something you should keep in mind. Um, for everything, I think, I, I don't know anyone who says they don't need money. Uh, so uh, with that, academic faculty jobs, you know, academic jobs do take a while to pay you well. And in India, of course, we follow this very fixed slab structure. We can't really negotiate our salaries. Industry might give you much more leverage in that situation to really say, this is what I bring to the table and you need to pay me appropriately. That's not how academia in India works. So take your personal situation into account. Yeah, I, I think that's really, really good advice to you. Uh, I just want to add if, if we think into a like, more romantic perspective, uh, instead of thinking only in money and stuff like that, I think it's true that it's really competitive, but also one of the differences between, that I see in between academia and industry is like, it depends what you kind of work that you like to do. If you want to have like your own ideas, well, it's not that in industry you don't have that, right? But you are always like money driven, product driven, and it will, you will have less freedom, right? So if you want to have more freedom, obviously probably academia is a better path that if you want to, like if we are talking more about what you like to do, know about you know how much money you want to make and so on. If you, obviously, if you want to have like a better job, probably industry is the way. But there's still like some people that maybe are thinking more into you know develop their own ideas and stuff like that. And then it's probably yeah, academia is the way to go on that. But you have to be like the, my colleagues say, you have to be really uh, realistic and you have to go. For academia, you can only go if you have like a really good publication and stuff like that. So if you want to go for academia, you have to like work really hard now to, to be able to, to have this opportunity in the future. Yes. Uh, when, when you are, when you decided to go to industry, I think then, then you already uh, made your decision and um, uh, there is only then the industrial career which, which uh, you could could have to go back from industry into academia, this is very difficult. So uh, when, when I'm looking on myself, and that was a few years ago, uh, a few, 10 years ago, and uh, then the situation was completely different. So uh, when I started, uh, I, I decided to go for an industry career, but at that time, it was possible that you can do some academic research mm -hmm. in, 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 the, uh, in, in the industry. So, when I started at Sando, they asked me, oh, what do you want to do? And I, I happily, happily took that and, and, and I built up some, some uh, own developments, publication and so on, so which I also could, could use in parallel and uh, to for, 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 for planning also an academic type of career. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but, but this is, to, uh, nowadays, I think that is very difficult. Um, uh, the only uh, way is still possible, I think. 
Do you yeah. think it's possible? Like, I, I, uh, I think in the other way around it's still possible because I see recent cases, for example, uh, Luftov recently, he was at EPFL and now he moved to Roche because he got an offer and this happened quite often, like if you have a, you are already established in a lab or, you know, the people can see and maybe they want you to incorporate, or even postdocs, I saw some cases of, you know, some postdocs that have been maybe five years postdoc mm -hmm. and then they still have the opportunity to go into the industry if they have the profile that they are looking for. This is yeah. probably possible, I, I agree. If you are in academia, you can go after a postdoc right. and after you profile yourself, then you can go, mm -hmm. go, go uh, into industry. So this is a, the, the normal way. And I would, would, uh, would also encourage people to, to make a postdoc, to go out, to show that you can work independently, and then, then you can uh, uh, go into, into industry. Uh, but uh, the other way around is, is, yeah, diffi yeah. is, is, is difficult. So. Yeah, well, one uh, addition to that, uh, being from the industry, I can tell you, age is a big barrier. Uh, so for us to hire somebody at the age of 50 from academia into industry, is much less like less less likely than somebody who's 30 35 years old so don't wait to you know fail in academia and then say oh now i'll go to industry it doesn't work that way uh, you got to make up your mind within the first few years of your academia uh, otherwise the likelihood but on a single every single day it'll decrease of your attractiveness to industry okay so that follows. The next question that we got, uh, pre-sent-in pre, uh, question was, whether it's academia or industry, what are some basic things we need to know to be successful at a job, whether it's an academia or industry? So. Uh, yeah, I, I can, um, since I'm the oldest here, <laughs> I'll, I'll take the privilege. I, I think the basic skills that anywhere you need um, and that uh, Indian students, including myself and Manny and Suresh, we all lacked was good communication skills. Uh, you have to be able to communicate your science to an individual who is from a completely different area. Not everybody you will meet you will be from MPS who is looking to hire you. You should be able to explain to them what you do. So communication, I think, is, I would say, 50% of the battle. The other 50% uh, is being, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, you have to be a go-getter. Sitting in a corner there and expecting somebody to come and say, I want to hire you, zero chances of that going to happen, right? So uh, w along with good communication skills, you also have to be uh, forward-looking. And these days, you have so many tools. You don't need to go and touch and feel anybody. You do LinkedIn, you do email, you do whatever, but reach out to them from your side, right? Nobody is going to come and reach out to you, however bright you may be. So excellent communication skills, work on that. And secondly, outreach. Your individual outreach has to be very strong. What would you say? Uh, yes, I totally agree, both in academia and in industry, because in academia you have to sell yourself, right? If you go to a to a interview and then you are like uh, really shy, you don't say what you are, or you don't sell yourself, then you probably will not get the job. So, But I want to add to that that uh, something that uh, many students maybe don't, don't put, well at least in Europe, I don't know, I think that here you have a high level of students, but in Europe I see that when some students need to do a poster or do a, like a communication, um, they don't put, they don't think it's so important, right? They think, oh, it's a poster for a meeting, whatever. But I think actually this is really important. Every time you do that is showing to the public or to other people, it has to be perfect. Because for example, now here with the posters, maybe some of us have opportunity for someone of, the, of, of you, and then we see a perfect poster, someone that explains really well the poster, and that is gonna be maybe your future. And it happened to me actually, when I was doing my PhD, uh, I was presenting my poster, and then Thomas Hartung came to see my poster, and then stuck with me, and he offered me a job as a postdoc. So this is really important to put maximum effort always in all your communications, because you never know who's going to be there watching, or he's going to, who, 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 which people you are going to meet, that we are going to open some opportunities in the future. That's, that's absolutely true. Correct. So, Armin, we'll take this question. You know, so we saw in a lot of the labs. Uh, you want I to continue? Could, could, that? Could continue. Okay, please, so, please. I think it's uh, it's important that um, what I agree with all what you said. Uh, 
Uh, I think it's important that you are a team player. So you need to, to be a team player if you want to, to be a success, successful, uh, either in a company or, or I think uh, academia, I cannot, uh, I assume also, yeah? Yes. And um, you, uh, what, what you have to do in industry is also to be a good scientist and, and uh, you have also to talk about yourself that you are a good scientist and everyone should, should see that, that you're a good scientist, to advertise yourself. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not good enough to be it. Uh, and you, you also have to, to, to make a little PR about that. So, so I mean, like what you said, um, pushing yourself forward or being yeah. a go-getter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also uh, lying to, to, to your stakeholders. So, so you learn a lot, yeah? yeah, what you should better do, but, but also what you better not should do. So. Absolutely. I think those were some very good points that they can actually implement. Now, the another question is, so a lot of the PhD students here are going to think of doing a postdoc in organ on chip or microphysiological systems, maybe in Europe. We saw that a lot of the European labs do have Indian students as postdocs and PhD students as well. Now, what really, so what really is the path after an Indian student does a postdoc in a European lab? What are the chances of them getting a faculty position in that lab versus, you know, having to then transition to an industry in Europe? after that postdoc. So based on your experience. Um, so I can, I can say that so, uh, if, if someone from abroad is, is applying to, to Switzerland, for instance, they, they need also to, to have the permission to, to, come, to come into the country. Mm -hmm. It is some, some, sometimes very difficult. To, like a visa. Like a visa. Yeah. And uh, w once they have it, I think then, then there's no difference anymore. But, but this is the first uh, barrier uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to get in. From, uh, from, from uh, my recent experience, because I'm hiding a postdoc now, um, I don't think it matters where are you coming from, actually. I don't think it's important. And actually, in, in countries, for example, like Switzerland, that are quite close, like they, they don't open the borders too much, you know, so it's hard to get the visa. Actually, it's not so difficult as a student, right? Uh, this postdoc is from China, and China is the ones that have the, the prob probably the highest problems to come to, to Switzerland, and it's not difficult, because if you have your contract, the visa is done automatically, right? So I don't think uh, people from this country will have any issue to go to any other country, I, I, I have to think, because from US you see many people from this country, and in Europe also now, and I don't think that will be a, a limitation. No, not at postdoc level, but if they apply for faculty, what if it's like e for EU f uh, funding for EU citizens, those faculty positions or those institutes? I, I, think, I think for faculty, they're like, in, in the end, or at least in the most of like high level universities, they are gonna look for the best profile, right? If your CV is better than anyone from the country, you are gonna get the position. And, I, and then for the funding, if you have your visa, you can apply for European funding, so it will not change much. And I haven't seen, at least in Switzerland, in Spain it's a little bit weird because, you know, a little bit of mafia, you know, in the university. <laughs> but but in, in, yeah, in, in Switzerland, um, I, I don't see that. I think, and I think Germany, you know, Austria, is gonna be, whoever has the best profile is gonna stay. But you have to take into consideration that for these positions, they are also evaluating how good are you, like with the with the maybe other students, like master students. They are gonna check also that. So if you are nice and you have a good profile, you have a good chance to get there. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, yeah, Armin, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much. So, but this is directly what you said. I, I believe. Um, if you are in a big company, I think uh, then you have no problem. So if you have in a smaller one, yes, because they have a contingent, which is uh, then according to, to the size of the company. So no, I was talking in, in, in academia. academia in academia, yes. And in, academia. in industry, I think it's, it's also possible if someone really wants you, if you are the, the expert, then they pay for that. So, and uh, they, they let you in and they get also the connections to, to let people from, from abroad in. And, and so that's, that's my answer. Yeah, I, I was going to say the situation is actually, to be honest, I've lived all my life in the US and kind of grew up in my professional life. Uh, you, you certainly should, Europe, I have no problem, you should look at, but there, there's nobody stopping you from doing a postdoc and looking for a job in the US. So certainly do not discount, just because you did a PhD and a post not eligible to get into the US. You should certainly look at it. I would also say I have two or three offers at the table. 
don't just count on one uh, offer saying this professor had said he would make me you know that may or the professor might get hit by a truck and die tomorrow you don't know so have three or four offers including europe india india i think is very attractive right now and certainly us that would be my strategy yeah sounds very good um do we have any questions from the audience at this stage yes please you can come to the mic great so hi um i have done my phd from university of munich in germany and uh, um Two years back, I came back uh, and wanted to do a postdoc here. I wanted to live close to my family and at the same time just be in India. Uh, but since the day I landed in India, everybody asked me just one question: that why did you come back? So. So that makes the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I returned to India in 2018, and the people I was most scared to tell I'm returning to India is the Indian community in Austin, Texas, and Indians in India. <laughs> when i told americans i'm returning to india they said power to you go change your country yeah. and when i told indians i'm returning to india they were like who does that <laughs> so anyway, so it almost feels like i have done some sin or something like that no no uh, well, let me tell you one thing the india that i and mani and suresh left which is back in the 90s is not the india that is today the the living conditions the conditions for science the funding is completely changed so i don't think you have made a mistake at all you have a fantastic opportunity to build i mean the work you're doing in gallbladder you said those only two or three people in the world exactly. that alone tells you that you are in a great spot and your indian government gave you money to do all this so i would not worry about the dreams of living in us are gone you know those i mean many and i have no desire to go back but we have to go back for family reasons whatever so don't chase those dreams because those have become nightmares now yeah, you're in a great spot Thank you absolutely sir. well done thank you that is great advice and we uh, obviously don't want to replicate we cannot replicate europe or american science in india we have to do science in india with what right. our circumstances are yeah you right. you get a lot more respect in as a scientist in india than you do in the us i can tell you that in the us i had to do my own grocery i see a nobel prize winner standing in the line next to me none of that would happen here you know if you ever win some award there's going to be a lot of respect for you sir so. that's great uh, yes please yeah. so uh, you guys discuss about post doc positions and all so as a master student perspective how you guys would uh, like suggest me to go ahead like consider phd as a experience before starting up for some uh, major problem solving or should i take it as a challenge uh, to start my like research career itself uh, with a problem that i want to solve in future this phd experience is phd supposed to be the career building stage or Um, is it just getting the degree is is difficult to to answer that because uh, first first um, normally in your psd you are not going to decide what you're going to do right you're going to get a position in somewhere that they're going to tell you you have to do this because i get money for this so forget about decide your own project as for sure uh, but i don't know it's it's really, really difficult to say i think i think for for academia obviously you have to do your psd yes or yes i think for industry you have two sides if you do your psd maybe your entry level in the industry uh, is going to be better pay right um, also there are some hybrid uh, in in switzerland at least where you can do your psd in industry uh, so that is a good step you know to get your psd but also have your feet inside industry um, but there's also in some companies it's going to be easy to enter without just your bachelor right they have these entry level positions where they want to teach you everything from zero they kind of mold you what the company wants right so i think for academic is clear for industry i'm not sure maybe you guys know no whether... let me just cut to the chase whether it's industry or academia if you want to be in science you need a phd otherwise what will happen in 5 years you will stagnate you will see people who were with you junior to you doing a phd they might end up being your boss if your vision and clarity is to be in science for the next 15 20 years there is no way out you have to do a phd there is no shortcut unfortunately yep but if you want to do industry check for these opportunities of hybrid where you can do the phd together with uh, some companies so then it help you a lot you know to continue maybe then. thank you Uh, what i would encourage um is that if you want to have a phd 
you can also go in, in industry to do a PhD. Yeah, so this is a very good entry uh, position. And I had about 10, 10 PhD students, and they all found uh, positions in industry thereafter. So um, industry PhDs are not that common in India. Yeah, yeah uh -oh. you don't get them. You don't get them. No, very, a, very. A, a, they are not that common. B, I don't know how they are valued versus an IISC, you know, so. Yeah. So then maybe doing an industry PhD out of India could be an option. Yes, yeah. why not? Uh, okay, hello, hi. Uh, this is exactly my question. How does one uh, navigate oneself through industrial PhD in India and abroad? Because that might be one of the possibilities for me. So I just want to know this. Um, so Dr. Reddy's, uh, when, you know, I was part of uh, the group there, we sponsored uh, PhD students not to do PhD internally. We'd go somewhere outside and do it. The only reason we did it is not because we are charity, because we thought you had a potential and you would come back and contribute. So we actually make you write a contract saying after you finish a PhD, you will come back and serve for three to five years. So uh, industry sponsored PhD is not a freebie. There will be strings attached to it. So just think about that. If you don't want any strings attached to your PhD, then go do it in academia. Um, out, of India. out of India, yeah. Uh, industry PhD, say, in Switzerland or Germany. Uh, I, I know one person that did that, and she moved straight to the industry after she finished her PhD in the same company. So for, I think for her was a good, um, good choice. Uh, also, it's kind of half of the university, so you kind of link with the university. So you have to do final exam in the university and so on. But I think it was good because you get your title. That is why you want to grow, like uh, he was saying. Uh, but also you have already, you know, you know the people, the, the contacts, you know maybe the manager or, the, you know, whatever. So. I had once a, 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 a PhD student from Cameroon, and, uh, and after that he, he went to Canada. So he, now he's in Canada. So. Okay. So All right, uh, so go to a industry, uh, see if I have a position and then start an industrial PhD is what? Uh, no, 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 the positions are already open as a, as a PhD. So right. you will All go right. and you will see Roach has two PhD positions sure, open. Sure, sure, sure. So okay. it's kind of linked with that. Let me understand, if your ultimate goal is PhD, why tie yourself to industry first? I mean, your likelihood of getting a good PhD, 99% is better off in academia than in industry. Go to uh, academia, finish your PhD, and then come back to industry. All right. All right. Yeah. That's Thank always you. an option. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Any more questions? I have a question. Um, so I spent a year and a half working in a research lab trying to figure out whether I wanted to do a PhD, but I thought that my research acumen, the way that I kind of, you know, when I read a paper, I look at it, I'm, I'm not able to identify, you know, the gaps. I'm not able to really think of how I could address these issues. Do you think that is, uh, that kind of scientific acumen, do you think that is something someone should have before they join a PhD or is it something that, you know, you learn on the way? Because I, I would not want to get into a PhD and then, you know, halfway through realize I can't do this and drop out. Yeah, so um, when I said you have to do a PhD in science, I meant if you want to be a hardcore scientist. But if you have a master's in science and you can go to do um, consulting, there's companies such as Boston Consulting, McKinsey, uh, there are positions within the industry that are more clinical research oriented that don't need to be. So there are many other options if you don't want to be tied to be a hardcore scientist. And there are plenty, they're all coming up now. Uh, the best thing would be to go and do an internship in a company. I would strongly recommend that. Um, and understand the different aspects of how the industry works. And there might be something you like there. You might say, I love the stuff the patent department is doing. Let me be a patent uh, legal analyst or something. So as long as you have made the decision you don't want to be a hardcore scientist, then there's uh, at least half a dozen different positions that will open up for you. But don't remain in that confusion too far, uh, for too long, because you're simply, three and a half years into it, if you haven't made up your mind, I say I don't, I wouldn't recommend <laughs> going that way. So that, that would be me, yeah. But I think, Anushka, the second part of your question was if you don't, if, like, if you can't identify gaps in literature, that's what you were saying, right? Mm -hmm. When you read a paper, oh. is it something you will, I think it is something too early to expect. You will learn this on the job. 
Mm. And probably even yeah. mid-career yeah. scientists struggle to put the whole field in perspective to figure out what is the gap. So it's, uh, I feel you will learn it on the job. It's not a reason not to do a PhD, but you can all please opine. I think you will, you will always have these doubts. Or <laughs> <laughs> so this is a learning curve. You, uh, I think you will learn that. So when I look on my PhD, I, I, I made a lot of mistakes, but, but I was yeah. learning by the mis mix mis mistakes. And, and finally, uh, that helped me to, to, to learn really uh, also to, to, uh, to cope with uh, frustration tolerance. So, and, and this is also uh, very important for us. Yeah, I, I think a sim simple rule of thumb is when you get up in the morning and are excited about seeing the new data that's going to come out from your latest experience, then the, you're addicted. You will, you know, if you're not excited and say, oh my God, I have to go and do this, then yeah. It's probably not for you. It's a very simple rule. Yeah. I, I think that's why I made the switch. But I did want to uh, follow up to the question about, you know, working in different companies. Um, for India, it's still you can approach and do this thing. But if you're looking for opportunities abroad, usually, I, this is a little bit of a more on emigrating, emigrating and everything. Um, is it wise to even apply for those opportunities? Because, you know, there's a lot of issues with visas and they don't allow um, residents from outside the country to apply many times. So how can you kind of yeah, Your that? best bet is to go there as a student. Yeah. So either an MBA student or do a master's in hospital management, whatever else. So don't look for a job. Your likelihood of being hired without being a US citizen right out of India is very low. But you wanting to go there as a student and while you're there trying to find a job is much easier. So is it the same with Europe? Sorry, uh, Europe, I don't know. Yes, I think it will be the same. If, if you don't have, like, if you are in your early career, it's hard to, to, to kind of justify that you are better than someone from the country, right? So unless you have, a, you know, you have experience with stem cells, you have experience with microfluidics, maybe you can, you know, find an opportunity. But if you just finish your bachelor in science, it's really hard to, to say, okay, this person from India is better than these 20 people from Switzerland, right? So... In that case, I agree. I think you normally will go, maybe do a trainee or do, for example, uh, I don't know, European Commission has sometimes offered for trainees or, or um, yeah, try to, to, to do like a course or a master or something like that. And when you are there, it's when you have to knock all the doors, try to make connections and try to find the, the job. Thank you. Uh, and while we have more people coming up to the mic, another question came on the, uh, on the WhatsApp was, in the Indian context, if you're not eligible to give the national entrance exams, in the Indian context, how should somebody go about doing a PhD? I think you, sh you should answer because I have yeah, really yeah. Or no anybody clue. Can. I think the I only no few clue. options, in India, if you want to do it, I think self-funding is one way which is not easy. Uh, the other thing I would think of, but our tuition and all is much less than Europe and North America. So self-funding is still possible. The other thing I would think of are Tata fellowships and other things. But I don't know, Abhijit or anyone, if you can't clear CSIR, GATE, PET, how are you going to enter the PhD? Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but you were looking at me, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> don't look at her, please. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, that's our, our real problem. Uh, I had, I mean, I have one student, she actually, I mean, she is a, you know, she is an example in, in herself. She is in a banking job. And now her, uh, you know, son and daughter, they are doing PhD. And then she decided to do her own PhD. Uh, she is like very dedicated, but I could not take her in because there was no option. Uh, so finally, she has registered to Mumbai University as a self-financed and then kind of working so uh, with me. Would self be the option. Uh, one option is that if in some project position, if it is not a government funded project, if it is a industry funded project, there we have a little bit of flexibility to take the you know people of our choice. But otherwise, yes, age is a big problem in Indian exactly. academia. Clearing these entrance exams, because that's what the fellowship, you need the fellowship. Fe fellowship. Uh, uh, the Abhijit, how much would it cost to do a PhD out of pocket in India? Are we talking lakhs or crores? Or? No, obviously not crores. Yeah. Okay. We are t so we are talking about the tuition fees. So like we say per semester, I would say like the roughly one lakh, suppose. So if five years, 10 lakhs. And then Lakh. living expenses. 
I am assuming that person, you know, living somewhere in the close by and, you know, all, all other additional plus things. You have yeah, I was, uh, the reason I asked yes, you that is if it is a lot of lakhs, then consider way that option versus funding your way to the U.S. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I think you should think about that too. Yes. Independently yeah. is not an option with your family and everything. I have a question. Uh, what hap what's the process to do it if you want to do a PhD like above 35? Yeah. If you're like an old person, mid-aged, yeah. <laughs> how do you do a PhD? Yeah, you look really old, yeah. Uh, who is old in this room? No one's over 35. You, mom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, we, we answered that a little bit. Yeah, you can sit down. We answer that. We answer that. So I'm now jumping between mom and scientist, as you can see. But we answer that a little bit. I think clearing the entrance exams might be a challenge because of the age limit in Indian science. So then probably going abroad or self-funding would be the option, because abroad there's no really age limit to starting a PhD. Uh, by the way, just uh, you know, I would just uh, um, at least you know for IITs. I mean, I'm talking about the engineering field. If you have MTech degree then you can actually come you know, and you know, join at any age. Yes. Also, if you have some, uh, say, um, uh, you know, MSc degree, then um, two or say two to three years of research experience or some relevant industry experience, then also you can come and join uh, you know, as a PhD. Without the entrance exam? Without the entrance exam. So, but then your guide should have some means to support you. Get, uh, Bharadwaj, go to the mic, please. Yeah. Oh, it's not working? Yeah. Then you have to shout. <laughs> Actually, this is a very rare case. So a 16-year-old boy also got a PhD and a 95-year-old woman also got a PhD in this country. And the other way to get a PhD for a non, uh, of course, we are talking about science, but in general, a PhD is uh, honorary PhD. You do something great in another field, uh, honorary yeah, but PhD is talking science PhDs. Correct. Yeah. Uh, correct. Yeah. yeah, that is not possible at either 16 it, or unlikely at 19. But independent, uh, sub, there are a few people who are called independent scientists who don't fit into any of the uh, structured uh, uh, system in the India. But even uh, they also got PhDs. Okay. Uh, they call themselves as Indian, uh, independent scientists. So they also got PhDs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, till we get more people at the mic. Yes, please. Sure. Okay. I'm just following up. Uh, following up on her question before. So uh, while it is true for the undergrads, it's really hard to get a job abroad. Uh, is it the same case for post PhD as well? I mean, do you do the companies still prefer peop local people or if you're staying in that particular country post your PhD doing a short stint of postdoc or something? Uh, are you more preferred for the job, job as compared to a person sitting remotely somewhere in a different country? So I will talk uh, for US and they will talk about uh, Europe, I guess. Uh, in the US, uh, what is holding you back if you're outstanding to get in the job is the visa situation. Um, so if the company is willing to sponsor you, for that you need to have exceptional skills. In general, your best bet if you're a finished a PhD or a postdoc is go for a second postdoc, a first postdoc, and there then uh, you have to get your foot in the door in the U.S. Exactly. Because Sitting here, uh, you will not. And immigrant visa is impossible right now, so you have to go through, uh, you know, these, uh, I, I, what they call it? H1B. Um, H1B. H1B. Yeah, B1, H1. B2, J1, H1 is rare. They're all yeah. taken by IT people, so... But yeah, get there somehow, whatever, find an avenue. Marry some U.S. citizen, I don't know. <laughs> but get there and then oh, many doors will open up for you. Sitting here, those doors are all closed. I actually, um, I'm, can, can, I'm can here I? since 2008 now. All right, yeah, as you said, I'm a U.S. citizen. But I trained a lot of people here who joined as an MS students here in my labs in Pune, Advinus, etc. Uh, you would be surprised to see that actually some of them work for Shanta Biotech, Thermo Fisher, and all these multinational companies. Uh, they don't have a PhD because they were working for MNCs and they proved themselves two, three years later. They gave them B, whatever L1, B1, whatever the visa. Within three years, they got green cards in the U.S. So there are opportunities if you work for MNCs, but you got to prove yourself that you are one of the best out of the lots and who can be transferred there. 
But these are rare occasions, I'm telling you. Three, three I know with master's degree, one with PhD degree also I know, moved to US and now they all have green cards. So it, it is possible, but don't uh, keep your hopes up uh, on the drought, okay? Shadi.com. <laughs> is it the same for Europe as well? Uh, is it, does it matter if you stay closer in this country and apply for a job there or is, does it? So the question is, if you have your PhD done here, if you will get a job as a industry or academic? Industry, industry, of course. Industry. I think if you have a really good PSD here, you have the same chance as anyone in Europe. If you are PSD, you got three natures, I'm pretty sure they are going to get you in industry, right? So in the end, it's going to depend on the CV, right? If, is it worth it to get you or not, you know? Yes, um, my answer would be the same. So um, um, for, for Germany, I, I, I think they, they opened the, the immigration rules to, to allow foreigners also to come to, to Germany to work there. So that the, the situation improved. So there, there I see some possibilities. Mm -hmm. huh? Thank you so I do not know the details, but, but, yeah, but, yeah, uh, but, it, but it certainly, if you're qualified, and uh, then, then I think you, you can, can come. Oh, doors are open. And also I heard some, like from Roche, I had some friends in Roche, they, I heard some complaints that they were uh, having some issues to get good candidates actually for, for a job position. So uh, it's not so easy now. So I guess you guys have a lot of opportunities. Good chance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, I have a question. So from India, now I'm a student who wants to do PhD but currently working as a project student. If I have the qualifications, I have the experience, I have publications, still if I'm not able to clear uh, even the first stage of, uh, you know, apply, uh, any application in Europe, say Max Planck or any applications in US, what could be the possible reasons? Like if I have cleared the exams, I have good grades. Um, so right now, a lot of students in India are facing rejections from Europe. Europe has become a, a destination to go for PhDs because you get done in three years, four years, as opposed to the US, which is five years, seven years, very open-ended. In Europe, they sync up your PhD with your funding. So right now, with post-COVID, a lot of people are getting rejections. It might be a good idea to continue in the job that you have, get a few more publications, and then apply again in a year or two. I have been seeing from my own experience at University of Pune, a lot of students facing rejections. There's a tremendous COVID backlog. And would it be a like, good idea to approach the scientists directly without... You can, but even they are facing funding crunches. Mm -hmm. And many, uh, at least in the UK, a lot of funding is for UK citizens or EU citizens, which is another reason why it's difficult to land that position. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, we had somebody in our lab from Ferguson College. She had a master's from there. And uh, she came and worked for us for two years. She got probably three or four publications fully loaded scholarship in US and Canada, seven different places. So it appears that having a master's with some experience and publications seems to be the magic these days, as, as she said. I think work experience, even to get into a PhD uh, or a publication or two, is becoming more important than when we went. You know, I could have probably gone from high school also. Those days were different. But yeah, so get yourself uh, internship, job, get a couple of publications with the clarity of thought that your ultimate goal, you know, clarity of thought is very important that you want to go to uh, the U.S. So. I just want to add something like if, if, if you want to really go somewhere like a lab, uh, sometimes they don't have positions, right? But if you send a, a nice cover letter saying that you love the lab, it's the best lab in the world, like maybe they will have considerations in the future, right? I see all, all, some colleagues in the department where they got you know, some letters saying that they really want to go to this lab and maybe the opportunity comes in like three or four months and they will gonna be noticed and you know, they know that they were interested. So it gives a little bit of opportunity. It's not always the case, but many times you don't have the position. I, I receive sometimes some letters, I don't have the position, but then if in the future I get some funding, maybe I prefer these persons that were really interested than some random people that you know will apply to my position. Karishma, we, we need to answer the 70 year old guy's question next. So. <laughs> So my question is extremely theoretical. 
But what if a foreign national wanted to do a PhD in India? Are there specific implications for it? That's a, that's a, what, what about foreign nationals wanting to do PhDs in India? Yeah, I think that's gaining uh, in uh, gaining. It's getting more popular. That never used to happen, but now at the University of Hyderabad campus, where our company is incubated, I see a lot of uh, foreign students, both from Europe and Africa, coming doing PhD. Not in sciences, is mainly political science, you know, history, those kind of things. So yeah, it is possible. And I think and we shouldn't assume that all the Indian students are Indian nationals because the exodus to the US started in the 90s. So even if they had children there and returned to India, they would be in their 20s now. Yeah. So we do have a lot of students who are Indian origin but hold UK or EU passports, for example. Yeah. So it's possible to do a science PhD. Yeah, I, I, I love your passion. I, I, I was telling your mom yesterday when my daughter was your age, I would take her to seminars just to inspire her. She would face backwards and be either on her iPad or her iPhone. I have no clue doing what. So <laughs> I saw you were sitting, you didn't look elsewhere, you're pretty. That, you know, is a sure sign that she has to send you to Harvard one day. <laughs> he can self-fund it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for pointing out my situation, mom. <laughs> All right, you can sit down. Just to answer this 70 years old man's question, you know, uh, we, we actually have a lot of foreign nationals in terms of we have people from Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, you know, from our neighboring countries. We often don't think, you know, when you think of foreign nationals, we don't think of them. Yes. But we have a lot of the people from the Middle East, from, you know, uh, Africa, South Africa, at, you know, as you said. Uh, obviously very few from um, Europe or US, but from South America, South Africa and the you know, Asian countries, we have many, many uh, uh, foreign students, PhD as well as masters. Oh, fantastic. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Good to see this heterogeneity in Indian campuses. Yes. Yes. Um, so I have a question that's maybe more related to a little further down in a scientific career. So. Uh, whether we're in industry or academia, I think most people will end up in a role where they have to guide and lead teams, whether it's in a PhD or a student, or like teams to develop a product, deliver something larger than. Um, so how do you transition from working on a bench, thinking about your own project, being very operational and doing experiments, to taking a, a wider perspective, trying to figure out how to guide other people, and like, what is that transition like? And how is it for you? And do you have any tips for that uh, stage in your career? I, I can uh, answer for industry and maybe they can too. And then Karishma for uh, academia, the two of you and two. Um, so uh, at least in the industry, there is most big companies have a clear two track. You can either be on a research track or what's called a management track. So if you've chosen to be on a management track, you will typically begin being uh, director of a group of scientists and your responsibility is to make sure that they deliver the products. You yourself will not work at the bench or have a lab, but you'll be given money with the sole purpose you have to deliver these four products. So it's the director's job to make sure the timelines are met, the budgets are met and you're motivating. So in the industry usually it's very clear cut and you can make decision of that nature within five years of joining the industry. So industry, no problem. Clear the differentiation between, you know, who wants to run a research group versus who wants to be in management. And management gets paid a little better, by the way. That's what Manny told me. But how did you make the transition from working on a bench to, like, say, managing a team? And like, your mindset is very different. Your thought process has to evolve. So what is, do you have any advice for that? I, I don't know. Typically, like I said, people who are good leaders tend to, uh, you know, there is no, I think uh, good managers are people who are generally good leaders, which means communicate effectively, clarity of thought, compassion towards the other people, and looking for more and more responsibilities all the time rather than saying, you know, I don't want to volunteer for that because that means I can't play any more cricket or whatever. So those are the skills generally that will get you clarity of thought, excellent communication, outreach, and compassion for the team. If you don't have compassion for the team, uh, you'll be thrown out. So, yeah. Anand, David, you want to add something? How do you move from bench work 
to being a manager, you know, managing people's bench work. work. Yeah. It, it happens some, uh, automatically. <laughs> No, you, you start to, to, to be a scientist first, and then you have a larger group, and then you'll be a group leader, leader and then, then all of a sudden you get, get a director. And, uh, that, uh, so I, I didn't, didn't feel that how, how it happened, so it was not, it was not even my, my intent. So, yeah. so, but, well, and sometimes it's not good if, if you're making okay. this, this career a step. So. Yeah, and uh, sometimes people they develop steep, but but then they better should come come down so to do what they really like to do. But but the higher you you are in the management career, the less interesting the job is. Yeah, and, and yeah. so for for if you are a scientist. Yeah. In um, I think uh, the 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 transition is, for some people is harder than from other people I have to say in my in my case but I think you during your PSC right you will have maybe some master students that you learn you know how to handle then you will have to write your manuscript then you have to as a postdoc start writing grants so you know kind of slowly moving to paperwork kind of work and then leaving the lab and for some people it's really hard I see some PIs that still go to the lab sometimes do some experience yeah. But uh, I think you will get used to it. And in some point, I would say, if you work for like 12 years in a lab, in some point you are like, okay, someone can do the work and you will just do the writing, <laughs> right? So I think it's okay. It's just regular, like uh, gradual. It's not like a huge uh, change. Uh. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. uh, so in Indian scenarios, uh, Sales and industry has become a very big part that you have done whatsoever in your masters or you are a PhD or anything wherever you go in the company they will ensure that you are selling their products or like in some way now like being a technical specialist you have to be or meet people along with the sales guy and you have to pitch in your product as well. So how good that is for the system essentially because when you move out from a lab you have done immense amount of bench work after your PhD and you're like no I want to go in a lab work 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 but then the industry is expecting you to do in, like to do sales essentially ki bhai kuch bhi ho jai tumko apna saman bechna hai bas no. uh, I, I, I mean before you take this further it's not essential that every scientist in industry has to go with a sales team there is a dedicated sales team you may occasionally be called in to talk to a customer, but that's very, very rare. There is very effective salespeople, and uh, you, I have never been called to do a sales pitch for a product, for example, at the larger companies at all. There were salespeople okay. who knew, usually a lot of them are doctors who know exactly what the product and how to pitch it to the clinician, because the ultimate customer there was a clinician, okay. so yeah. So we'll end the session. There's just one more question if we can go through it really quickly because it was not addressed in any of the previous ones. Uh, someone has asked if, um, if one wants to explore a research domain in post-PhD which is different from their PhD topic, how much is this encouraged and how would you go about it? So you're doing research different from your PhD topic? It's really, really common. Like uh, you can do a, a thing. I mean, uh, unless it's, you know you you work in agriculture field and then go to neurotoxicology, right? So, but but I think it's really common that people start the PhD in uh, I don't know studying a protein in some whatever, and then they move to something more bioengineering or they go into chem chemistry. I think it's it's not bad thing and it's quite normal in that time because you basically don't know very well what you want to do, right? So. It's, I, I think after it's more difficult when you are a postdoc and you have already like two, 10 years of experience in something, it's kind of not, it's possible, but it's kind of more weird. But, but I think at PSG level, it's, it's completely fine, I think. Yeah, I uh, give you uh, my perspective. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, so I was going to say my perspective, I stayed with the same area for pretty much most of my life till I became management. Same with recovery in cardiovascular specifically. And my thinking was that if I have a deep, um, deep dive skill knowledge in cardiovascular, I'm more likely to be hired by industry than if I worked in four different projects and didn't really have a core expertise. So it just, everybody is different, I think. So, but for me, what worked was being in the same area, yeah. 
I find it very attractive that, that you always have to do new things. So, and uh, that's also why I stick in, in mechanistic investigative toxicology. Each track has a new challenge. It, it, you're starting really from scratch, and then you're jumping in, and, and you using then your, let me say, the way you, you, you work or you think, yeah? The, the, what the structures you really learned during your PhD and over the years, I think then you can efficiently apply that. So, and uh, it's, it's, it sounds difficult, it, it is difficult, but, but then you're working not alone. You are not alone, you're working in teams. And, and, and this, the team will, will do the work for, for you, in, in fact. So that's the enrichment. So, yeah. but, but you use out uh, then to, to cope with these complex uh, uh, projects. And, and you, you know people with, with you better collaborate, who are the experts. And, 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 and this is very, um, in my case, I find that yeah. excellent. I, and think, that it's I, I think it helps a bit if you, for example, know the techniques, right? If you work in molecular biology, but you do something, but then you can apply the same techniques to another kind of field, that's fine, because as a, as a PI, people are gonna look, okay, does he know how to do PCR systems or whatever you need, right? More than what was exactly what they were studying. So I think that limit a little bit. I will not hire someone that, I don't know, does something completely different skills to what I need. I will find, okay, I need someone in computer science, so I'm gonna look someone that has done computer science. It doesn't matter the field. If they can apply to what I want, is the person that I'm gonna choose. As long as you're the boss, and then that. Karishma, <laughs> uh, may I add my perspective just quickly? So you know, I mean, um, you, I mean, if you can cook biryani very well, so that's good. But that's not, in in my opinion, that's not enough. Uh, you know, you also need to know how to cook pulao and some vegan dish and you know some dessert. But you need to know at least one dish well. There is no point having five dish and everything is tasteless. So know one dish well and then learn a few other things. Nice it's analogy. Um, we are all getting hungry with that analogy. Perfect segue to dinner. Yeah. So I think we'll wrap the panel discussion for today. Thank you so much. I think it was very insightful and I think everyone uh, got to learn a lot. So I just want, uh, can we have a round of applause for everyone on the panel? So um, the workshop students can uh, stay back. The, this concludes the proceedings for today. Uh, the workshop students can stay here and uh, we'll be having dinner at 7.30 at uh, the CCMB canteen. So thanks for coming guys and have a good night. <laughs>